My name is Caroline Borisenko, and you are listening to the Actively Unwoke podcast. If you're ready to start fighting back against this woke cultural revolution that we are all experiencing at the moment, head over to ActivelyUnwoke.com and pick up a copy of my book, Actively Unwoke, the ultimate guide for fighting back against the woke insanity in your life. It is available in hardcover, in Kindle, and of course, even an audio version on Audible.com. All right, so I want to talk again about 1984. Now, I know I just talked about this in the last podcast, but it's top of mind. Because last night, I got together with a group of my supporters in my supporter Discord for movie night, and we picked out 1984, the classic, to watch it and have a discussion about it. And this is one of those things. First off, I was really surprised at how many people in my community, and these are my most dedicated supporters, I was so surprised at how many of them hadn't seen 1984 yet. And so if you haven't seen 1984, I definitely recommend you watch it. Of course, the book is always going to be the most ex- the, the most superior way that you can experience this type of work, but th- they really did do a good job with the movie, and the movie holds up. I think that that movie actually came out in the year 1984, and it really does hold up to movies that are coming out today. In fact, I might argue that the pandemic killed the entertainment industry, and there are no good movies that come out anymore, so 1984 is definitely holding up to them. But every time I engage with either the book through reading it or through listening to the audio version, because there is a great audio version of the book on 1984 as well, or by watching the movie, I always pick up on new things that you can see replicating in front of us right now. There are a couple things that I really picked up on last night. I'm going to touch on one of them briefly that really freaks me out. And I'm going to touch on another one that I think is an opportunity for all of us that are really in this game and fighting back against this woke cultural revolution for real. The thing that freaked me out is this. So this past weekend, this is Labor Day weekend in 2022, I ended up watching, well, a fair bit of real socialism. By pure accident, I discovered that a conference called Socialism 2022 was taking place in Chicago and they were live streaming some sessions from this conference on the internet. Now, when I say socialism, oftentimes this word gets thrown around really, really easily. And the right likes to say, oh, CNN, they're all socialists, or MSNBC, they're all so- socialists. No, 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 no. You do not understand what real socialism looks like until you actually watch socialists presenting in their, in their environment in the place where they feel most comfortable, at a conference called Socialism 2022. These are legitimate socialists. They call each other comrade. They all wear the same drab, baggy clothes. They are they are beyond far-left progressive. They are as far-left as you can get. It is extremely different than what you see on CNN. Although what is scary about it is I've been watching these socialist presentations for a while now, for a couple of years, And what is actually really scary is if you go back to legitimate socialist presentations from like five, six years ago, those are the same talking points that are showing up on CNN today, which should be an indication to all of us that the socialists are winning, by the way. If we can go back five years and watch legitimately far left socialist presentations and then turn on CNN today and hear those same talking points being spouted by the Democratic Party and put all over the mainstream media, that is actually a sign that the socialists are winning. So I spent all weekend kind of watching some of their content. I've still got a little bit more to watch, but one of the things that really struck out to me is one of their presenters was talking about how we need to abolish parenthood and abolish the family and abolition can only be achieved when the family is abolished. And so how do you abolish the family? Well, you outlaw pregnancy and make and require anyone who wants to have kids to do it through surrogacy. And one of the present- the presenters on one of the panels I watched, it was called Transgender Marxism. It was about as good as you might think it is. One of the the panelists on that session had literally written books called Abolish the Family and one about utilizing surrogacy in order to populate the planet. Now, they did this in 1984. 
I had never actually put two and two together before. For some reason, I this had just never clicked for me. They actually did this in 1984. They were trying to outlaw sex. They were trying to not outlaw it necessarily, but what what they were doing was not. It, ironically, it was not actually an authoritarian method in that they weren't they weren't outlawing it. They weren't banning sex, but what they were doing was making it culturally where people wanted to go. Culturally, they were trying to basically brainwash people to not want to have sex. They had the Junior Anti-Sex League in which women committed to being celibate their entire lives and pregnancy would only happen through artificial insemination. And they were they were conditioning people. They were socially conditioning people. So it was actually a lot more insidious than passing a law or passing a bill. They were socially conditioning people to put this on themselves. And now we're seeing it show up at legitimate socialist conferences. People saying we should outlaw the family entirely. The family is harmful and we should have all procreation happen through surrogacy. This happens in a lot of dystopian fiction. Well, quote unquote fiction. If you look at something like The Giver, The Giver is a children's book in which they do this. They also made it into a movie. Again, the book is much better than the movie, but both are pretty good. They did this in Brave New World as well. In Brave New World, they were allowed to have copious amounts of sex. Everyone belongs to everyone else, right? But children were born through artificial means. And now this is being presented at actual conferences in 1984, Brave New World, The Giver. All of these things, all of these these classic dystopian tales are now propagating and manifesting in real life on the side that is culturally winning. Because what gets presented at these conferences ends up in the mainstream media in just a couple of years. So that was a little disconcerting. But the other thing, and I have to give credit to a member of my supporter community for pointing this out. They said, look, Carlin, Winston is so, he has his eyes set on the proletariat. Winston, throughout 1984, talks about how the that hope lies in the proletariat. It lies in the polls. Hope exists when this community wakes up and turns on the party. These are people, Winston, of course, is a member of the party in 1984. He's an outer party member, so he doesn't get access to all the good stuff like the inner party members get. But he is a member of the party. He is a member of the social elite, the ones who have status in that society. And the proletariat, don't have that same status. They aren't members of the party. And he keeps saying, as soon we just need to wake them up. As soon as the proletariat wakes up, that's how this problem gets solved. But the party itself wasn't worried about the proletariat waking up at all. And we actually know this because when Winston was being tortured in the Ministry of Love later in the movie, they tell him flat out, we're not worried about the proletariat. They don't use that exact word. But it is made very, very clear to Winston that the inner party, the people actually pulling the strings, the people running the show, they are not worried about the proletariat waking up at all. Winston knows that that is where hope lies in an average, everyday people waking up and seeing what's going on in the world. He has his sights set on them for the entire movie, the entire book. He talks about the proles, the proles, the proles. Well, The people in charge aren't worried about them at all because they know that they're asleep. They know they're deep asleep, just like in the movie They Live. They're asleep. They don't know that they're surrounded by lizard people. They're just living their lives. They're just trying to survive. They're just trying to exist. They aren't members of the elite bourgeois status. They're just trying to live. And because of that, they're focused on other things. And the party produces propaganda to distract them all the time. They even talk about in the movie and in the book as well, I'm sure. I have It's been a minute since I read it. But I, they talk about in the movie about how the party proactively distributes pornography and other types of kind of salacious, lowbrow literature and stories out to the proletariat because it keeps them distracted. It's like it's like you know, watching movies with with loud explosions or getting caught up in in everyone being a groomer in schools and fighting each other. It's the same type of thing, right? 
in the land that we exist now, the media is constantly feeding us these distractions, whether that be through entertainment or overt propaganda that the media is producing to keep us fighting each other rather than fighting them. The people in charge, the establishment, will always work together. They know it's in their best interest to work together. That's why the Democrats and the Republicans are called the Uniparty. They are not different. They are not different at all. They don't really fight each other. They play fight each other. They play fight each other to keep the masses distracted because they know as long as the masses see the other side as the enemy, then they won't wake up. They won't wake up to who the real enemy is. The real enemy is not left versus right. It is not Democrat versus Republican. It is not progressive versus conservative. Those are not the real enemies. The real enemy is authoritarianism versus libertarianism. But if we have libertarianism, that means the people in power won't be in power anymore. It would fundamentally turn the whole system on its head. And so instead, they have to keep the masses distracted. They have to keep the masses distracted into thinking that they are at war with each other. Because if they're at war with each other, they aren't going to focus their attention where it could really, really do damage to the people who are really pulling the strings. We saw this play out in 1984. Winston knew that hope lied in the proletariat. But the party knew that they could very easily distract the proletariat any time they wanted. This is manifesting itself in front of us every single day, right now. The party knows. The uniparty knows. The people really pulling the strings, which is not Joe Biden, which is not not any Democrat politician. It is people far more powerful than them. Not any Republican politician either. (laughs) That should probably go without saying. But they know that they can keep the masses distracted. The establishment really doesn't like it when the masses start working with each other. We saw this in the Rainbow Revolution when Fred Hampton got assassinated for forming alliances with members of the KQ. He was a Black Panther that formed alliances with members of the KKK in Chicago in the late 60s, I believe. Got assassinated for it. We saw this at Occupy Wall Street where people started figuring out who the real enemy was. And it wasn't other people like them. It was the bankers. We saw this with GameStop when these hooligans on the internet started routing these companies and driving up the price of crypto just for just for kicks, driving up the price of different types of stocks that they wanted to invest in for kicks. That didn't go over really well with the establishment. And we see it now. We see it every single time an election comes up and people try to convince you that if you don't vote for their side, their particular political tribe, then you are wrong and bad and everything that is wrong with the world. And it's all nonsense. It's all a distraction. But our real goal has got to be waking more people up. Our real goal is exactly aligned with where Winston saw hope. I see hope in people that haven't red pilled yet. And red pilling is a long process. Red pilling is not just don't listen to any Republican that tells you that red pilling is about waking up and realizing that conservatives were right all along and then becoming a card carrying Republican and voting red forever. That's not what red pilling really is. They think it's what it is because they haven't woken up yet to the fact that their own side is just as bad as the left. No different than the left in any way. But our goal, our real goal, has got to be waking more people up. That is where hope lies, in waking more politically homeless people up. There are tribalists on both sides that are absolutely useless to us in this fight because they will always revert to their corners, whether they are on the left or on the right. It makes no difference. They are ultimately useless in this fight fight because they will always return to their tribalist corners no matter what. That is their highest priority. They are not people who are going to behave in any sort of principled way. Those are not people who you are going to share values with because they don't really have any real values. They only have tribalism. So we can't count on those people. We can't count on them at all. 
Where do we look then? We have to look to the politically homeless. We have to look to people who are disaffected with both sides. We have to look to the libertarians. We have to look to people that see that there is a lot of wrong in the world and a lot of arguing and a lot of bickering and that this is an untenable path. This is why the battle is not left versus right. It is not Republican versus Democrat. It is not conservative versus progressive. It is only authoritarian versus libertarian. The battle that we are in is between people who want to be able to control how we live our lives, what we say, what we think, what words we can use, what ideas we can consider, what discussions we can have, and what are off limits. It's between those people and the people who want to be able to be free to live their life in the way that they choose, regardless of if other people believe what they believe or not. People have to start getting more comfortable with the idea that different people are going to make different decisions than you. They're going to like different things than you. They're going to be motivated by different things. They're going to want different things out of their experience. And that has to be okay. You know, I'm working on this project called Schools Exposed, where I'm trying to get a crowdsourced journalism effort underway to expose what's going on in the public schools, but also I'm crowdfunding to be able to train 10,000 parents how to find out what the schools are teaching their kids using only publicly available information on their websites, on their social media, through FOIA requests, things like that. And I'm crowdfunding right now. You can go to unwokearmy.com slash parents, and that will redirect you right to my crowdfunding campaign. But One of the reasons that I'm doing this is to return power to parents to be able to make decisions, to give parents the ability to know what is going on in the public schools, and then to decide whether or not their values align with that. What people, what some people think I'm doing, though, is they think I'm attacking trans kids, which is not the the truth. It is not the case at all. The fact of the matter is, is I don't think that I don't really care if a kid is trans. I don't really care. Well, what I mean when I say I don't care is that it's none of my business. It is none of my business if their family supports them or not. I hope their family does. I hope they do. And by support, I don't necessarily mean staging a medical intervention. But if a child legitimately has gender dysphoria, then I can't imagine a tougher teenage experience. And I hope they do have a supportive family that helps them through it. That either is there for support or gets them therapy or help. I'm not personally in favor of medically transitioning kids under 18, but I also am not, I, I'm not the parent to that particular child, so I don't know how to make the best decision for them. It's not my call to make. It's their call to make. Anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is that in exposing what the public schools are doing, there are some people who believe probably many people who believe that I have an ulterior motive in doing it in order to force my values on other people. My values are that I don't care if you're trans. It's not my place to tell anyone how to live their lives or what to do. That's a discussion that should take place in the family, and then the family should decide what they're comfortable with. One set of values does not work for everyone, and you can't force people to live their lives the way that you would choose them to live it. So my project is not about, you know, attacking people with a certain gender identity because I want them to be happy and healthy. I just want them to be able to have the information to know what is going on and to be able to make decisions based on that. That's what I think we need to return to. We've got to stop forcing our values on to other people. Because their lives are not your lives. And that's how we start to wake people up. When people get very defensive, when you try to force something on them, when you try to say, this is the way you should live your life, and this is right, and this is wrong, and you should not step outside of these moral bounds as dictated by my religion. Well, not everyone practices your religion. Not everyone believes what you believe. Hope lies, not necessarily in the proletariat, Hope lies in liberty. Hope lies in freedom. Hope lies in creating an environment 
where everyone has access to the information they need in order to make the best decisions for them, where people are not pushing a political agenda, where you're saying, here's what's going on. You decide what you want to do with this information. That's what I want to do. I just want to show people what's going on. I think that a lot of people don't know. I think that there will probably be things that some people are fine with that are going on. I think that there will probably be things that people are shocked by that are going on in the schools. I just want them to have the information and then they can make whatever decisions they want. And if their decision is that they want to medically transition their child before they're old enough to drive a car, that is their decision. That's their decision in conversations as a family and in conversations with that child's doctor, and hopefully therapists, and other people who are involved, that's their decision. But I'm not going to be the person to tell other people how to live their lives, because I believe that hope only lies when we wake up people and help them to be able to live their best life based on the full breadth of information available to them. Give them the information, show them what's going on, let them make their own choices for themselves, but I shouldn't be making choices for other people. You shouldn't be making choices for other people. The government shouldn't be making choices for other people. Hope lies in waking more people up to what is going on in the world and then empowering them to make their own decisions about what to do with it. One of our number one goals has got to be waking more people up. And you don't wake people up by trying to force them to live like you do. You don't wake people up by trying to force your values onto them. You wake them up by giving them information and allowing them to think for themselves and come to their own conclusions. And they may decide that they agree with you on some things, and they may decide that they disagree with you on some things. That is where hope really lies. Can we wake more people up? Well, I know the establishment isn't worried about it because they control the media, they control entertainment, they control every single time the the two tribes of Republican and Democrat have spats. Can we wake more people up? I don't know. I don't know. I know that's where the answer is, and I know that the party is not worried about it. But, If we have to be here anyway, we may as well try and see where we go. I'm going to do my level best. I hope you come along and do yours as well. All right, that's all I have for this episode. If you would like to support the work I'm doing, you can head over to activelyunwoke.com slash support. Sign up as a member of my Patreon, five bucks a month, all the way up to 250 bucks a month, depending on which free perks you want. Well, I guess they aren't free if you're supporting, but you you will get perks as a result of your financial support, which I greatly appreciate. You can also find links to my locals community there. That's five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year. I know not everyone is uh, comfortable with Patreon. And so I provided other options as well. I have a subscribe star. I'm going to be revamping it a little bit, getting that back online. You can also sign up for paid memberships on my Substack. And of course, make sure you donate to my campaign to train 10,000 parents how to find out what the schools are teaching with only publicly available data. You can find that campaign at unwokearmy.com slash parents, and that will redirect you right to the Indiegogo campaign for the Schools Exposed program. All right, guys, that's all I have. We'll see you soon.